Hello everyone. Um, so this tutorial is intended to explain for those of you who have only limited resources and uh, and still want to deploy a fully functional Ceph cluster and test, debug, experiment with it and research uh, without worrying about storing petabytes of data or how fast or would be the operations in your system. So after using the power of virtualization, uh, Trua will walk through the steps as if you have access to a multi-node server system with humongous processing and storage capabilities. So what you learn here would still be applicable to a production cluster, that's the bottom line. The main note here is that this is not an elementary session. It requires you to know about virtualization, Linux operating systems, uh, networks, and of course, Ceph architecture. Main attraction of all that such abstraction in a local computer is to make everything resemble to real server case where we are acting just like we have a multi-node server cluster for our set to deploy. In fact, we can deploy anything on this cluster such as OpenStack or CloudStack, uh, but uh, we will focus on Ceph in this tutorial in particular. If you have any questions, recommendations, please feel free to email or drop messages under this video. Um, so let's get started. As I said, this session is not for beginners, so I thought maybe it's good to refer to those um, who wants to know more and learn more. Um, so I included uh, two, you know, links for you to read and uh, and enclosed few basic information about the software we're going to deploy in our session, and it's called Ceph. It is a um, you know, in a nutshell, an object-based software defined storage. What it means is that it stores data as objects. Uh, to my knowledge, objects are the highest level data access st uh, strategy of our time, meaning that blocks make up files and files combined with everything about the file called metadata uh, that would make uh, the object. Uh, they they are kind of you know set standalone data, and the bottom line is that they are easier to manage uh, compared to block and file uh, based uh, data. Ceph is based on a scalable, reliable storage device, uh, actually service um, for petabyte uh, of scale storage clusters, abbreviated as RADOS. Ceph uniquely delivers object block and file storage in a unified manner. And, uh, and Ceph also provides a nice API called Libratus for users to access RADOS individually. Um, so that what it means is that you can write applications, you know, uh, and include the libraries provided with this API, and you should just be okay to use Ceph at the back end uh, for your application. Here I draw a high-level overview of how Ceph works, um, you know, architecturally. Uh, please read Ceph documentation to familiarize yourself with the software. Um, as well as the, the general storage concepts. Of course, the main prerequisite, uh, I'm going to talk about tools and the prerequisites for this tutorial, uh, and the main prerequisite for this short tutorial is that you need to know enough basics about the storage concepts, um, virtualization, and Ceph in particular, the Ceph architecture, and computer operating systems uh, uh, fundamentals, again, especially Red Hat or, or, or CentOS Linux system. Uh, we need a computer which has enough resources to house our cluster and a low-profile laptop or a PDA or a phone uh, to remotely access that computer. Uh, the phone thing is a bit fancy. You may need more pre-installation work than you would if you use the laptop. So just, just be aware. Uh, the laptop part is for becoming a client, you know, an admin uh, client, in fact. Um, and you would also have, um, you know, need to have a soft uh, hypervisor, which is, in, in our case, we will use uh, a popular one, which is called uh, VirtualBox, uh, VirtualBox Open Source Virtualization Tool. It's great to have all these tools open, by the way. Finally, you need an operating system and, of course, Ceph object storage. Uh, so first thing first, Ceph has a construct called Object Storage Daemon, uh, who is uh, responsible uh, of uh, storing your data among other things so Ceph requires at least two OSDs um, and one monitoring daemon for a healthily functioning uh, cluster. Um, OSDs are recommended to be alive on uh, different nodes having their own IPs and network channels with any other daemons as well as the outside requests. So in our case, we will have to, you know, have two different networks for data path and control uh, path, as you will see. 
Um, and as you might have noticed, I include the links for each one of these tools so you can go, uh, go ahead and get more information and download the latest versions of these tools. Uh, you know, that would set you up before the tutorial. All right, there are a few recommendations pertaining to the tools uh, that we are going to use. For example, um, you know, if, uh, uh, I recommend uh, using VirtualBox guest editions, which usually allows you to have full screen, full resolution head, as well as automatic mouse capture, etc., uh, etc. Et type of features. The next recommendation is to statically assign your IPs uh, because you may end up hoping uh, networks. Especially, that's true for your laptop if it's a uh, uh, you know, if you're hoping network, you will go to somewhere else and you'll probably connect to a different network. It's tedious job to track your IP as an admin node in Ceph. Okay, so that's why. I also would recommend to get an IP from the range that starts with 10.0.0.0 again, based on my own experience. Uh, as I tested it on a two node cluster on my desktop computer, so the minimum requirements are four core CPU and, uh, and with at least uh, four gigabytes of RAM. All right, so next, we want to talk about setting up a, a virtual machine for Ceph. Um, first off, you need to launch an instance of CentOS 7. That's our, our operating system of choice. And we launch it on our virtual box. On your virtual box pane, when you click on the network, on the right, you will see adapters. We will have two adapters for our setting. Um, one, you choose breach adapter, the first adapter. Uh, and this is for your internet connections. The other popular alternative is NAT, right? But it will normally does not expose your VMs to outside world unless you do some form of port forwarding or something. So that's not recommended. Uh, for easy way, I would recommend you go with the first adapter set to breach adapter. And the second adapter is, the, is geared for internal network. This is your private network and over which our data communication will take place. In real servers, usually the internal network is on faster, um, you know, network interface uh, connector uh, ports, allowing faster communication uh, and which is perfect match to place data path on. So here we're actually simulating a real server case. The, the rest is regular stuff. You, you allocate memory, CPU, and other resources as appropriate and spin up your VM. Once the um, operating system is ready to use, open up a terminal and go to set pre-flight list and um, and that's by the way is on the web the SEPs uh, web page um, you basically execute all the steps given in that page for your VM and uh, and finally what it means is that you bring it bring your VM to a SEP ready state so that we can um, you know of, um, you know clone it so the next step is basically as I said cloning um, so you power off your VM once you're done with your downloads and installations, uh, uh, the next, fa next phase is, as I said, is powering your uh, VM off and, and use full clone option of VirtualBox to clone it, to choose a name. Um, that's the next step, choose the name. And, um, and that probably must be um, you know, different than the, uh, the name of the original VM. Cloning will generate a movable VDI disk image that you can use to spin up another VM with the separate state. You can clone it as much as you want, uh, or your hardware can support, of course. Either one of them is reached first. Uh, please see the minimum hardware requirements section for SAP. Again, it's also available on SAP web website. Um, you know, of course, you generate a lot of clones, you will probably run out of resources. Um, note that the number of clones you generate is the number of nodes in your cluster. Nodes that can have monitors, OSTs, and metadata servers, um, you know, running on them. Um, so after creating the clones, we have them uh, all powered um, on, and uh, and then and I mean it, the original might be powered on, we power it off, but the the clones are by default they are powered off. Next, we go to the settings for each clone and change the network MAC address for each of them. This is need to, needed to, you know to be able to get distinct IP addresses from DHCP servers for the first launch, right? So later you can uh, static the allocate IP. Um, next, you spin up your VMs, and I recommend you disable the display option for your VMs to save some uh, random access memory space. Uh, in VirtualBox 5 and above, um, I see that there's a drop-down start button that helps start headlessly, so you can use that feature with the new releases. The releases, releases. 
Um, so there's a side note that uh, I found very useful working with. Um, it's called Wagrant by Hashi Corporation, and this piece of software helps automatically provision VMs and spin them all together or, or, or kill them all together. So it basically adds automation to your development environment. One of the nicest features of Vagrant is that uh, the virtual box is built into it. So you, so you do not need to install it. And plus, you can use your favorite provisioning tool to configure your VMs. The key to Vagrant is something called Vagrant file. Vagrant uses this file to set everything up for you. You really need to develop skills uh, to be able to set up things like public and private networks and more. Um, and the Vagrant allows connections with Vagrant SSH, so, you, so if you need access with conventional SSH, uh, you would need extra effort. If you search on web, you will find a lot of information about it. In essence, uh, if you want to remove access to your Vagrant machine, uh, you shall need port forwarding, just like NAT setting in the VB. Um, and, uh, so, but the good news is that, that everything else, um, that, that this, this can be encoded into, into the Vagrant file as everything else. So, so overall, once you write a Vagrant file, you can speed everything up, you know, uh, with a, just a single clicking on the single button. Um, so, so overall, it's an interesting, interesting to look at. So here's the rough uh, representation of our network structure. Client or admin connects Ceph through a public network and all the monitors, mm -hmm. metadata servers, and all heartbeats, you know, take place over the public network. Uh, these data is not bulky, you know, short, small uh, messages, and depending on your workload, of course, it usually generates non-frequent I.O. On the other hand, the data communication takes place on the private network with preferable faster connect points and ports that are capable of delivering better performance. Alternatively, you can have multiple public and private networks depending on your physical needs, and you can also take care of it by playing with crush hierarchy, uh, if you're familiar with the SAF's terminology of crush. Uh, that you have to also change the crush hierarchy accordingly. Also, uh, let's talk about storage drives and OSTs and the mapping between them. So the question, how are we going to map storage drives and OSTs? If your local m computer is resourceful of drives, it is recommended that one drive for operating system, preferably SSDs, uh, one drive for journaling, you know, preferably SSD, and I'm assuming that you use ex 4 a or XFS as the local files, and the default for CentOS 7 is XFS, by the way, and one drive for OSD data pad backend, uh, which is going to be HDD, the hard disk. Uh, the economical way involves partitions, one partition for each, uh, you know, operating system, one partition for operating system, one partition, a different partition for journal, and another partition for OSD data pad backend. Uh, the size of these uh, probably will be unequal, you know, unbalanced. Uh, the, the, the data pad backhand probably will consume uh, the majority of your disk. And journal and operating system will probably will manage to have, you know, few, um, um, you know, half terabyte, maybe half terabyte for, uh, you know, for both, um, you know, would, would probably be okay, you know. The recommended local file system uh, by the Ceph community is XFS. Through, uh, you know, most recently they've disclosed Blue Store, which is based on block level data pad access and avoid the file system overhead. I suggest you take a look at that new OSD backend feature. Here's a rough overview of how our network configuration looks like, um, you know, using VMs. Uh, we have one admin node and a one monitor and multiple OSD nodes. If uh, you also want to use file system feature, we would need metadata server as well. Uh, could stay in the same node or maybe stay uh, on another node. Uh, it depends uh, on your preference. Computer host operating system employs a local DHCP server for the living VMs on it and provides internal network IP addresses. Here at, uh, here at the bottom, I show you how you configure a configuration file given the public and private networks you set up for your VMs. Both networks need to be specified in this configuration file, and of course, you will need to copy it to all Ceph nodes after you modify it. Um, Ceph deploy tool uh, might be useful for that purpose. Um, Ceph uses class interdomain routing, uh, abbreviated as CIDR notation for subnets. So the first four number is the network IP address, and the rest is the subnet number based on CIDR. All right, um, so that's it. You have a cluster node now ready for you to deploy uh, Ceph. Just go to the Ceph web page and 
you know, read the instructions, begin installation as instructed on the web page. Um, so, all right, so I, I want to end up my time with, uh, with this short tutorial by mentioning about uninstalling the software and removing the virtual machines. First, you will need to remove the local DHCP server from the computer host machine by specifying the internal network name as shown. Next, you use uh, three basic commands in the order shown uh, in this slide to uninstall Ceph. You know, these commands uh, do not remove everything, um, so I recommend to look into the files under, uh, for example, where logs are stored in each of those nodes and uh, or var log. Uh, there's also uh, var local Ceph directories in all these nodes, um, so you want to check them uh, under these directories. You want to check them if there are any remaining garbage uh, leftover files. You can basically, uh, you know, erase them or remove them uh, manually. Finally, go to VirtualBox, find the VM you want to remove, uh, right-click, remove it from uh, from all the files stored in the virtual drive that VB created for you. All right, guys, I hope this short tutorial has been helpful uh, for many of you to create and manage your virtual cluster environment to run test cases for Ceph and hopefully for any many other distributed software systems. Thank you very much.